Children are growing up in this country with a siege mentality. They're growing up being told not to go outdoors, do not go out of the yard, do not go out of the house. In fact, what we have been seeing our children are not even safe in their own houses with their own relatives. Freedom and independence for children are things that build character and self-esteem and allow them to grow into the sort of people that can take over leadership roles. Diana Mahabia Wyatt, Escalation in General Lawlessness Debate, April 26, 1994. Some individuals do not need to read biographies of great people. They practically are living examples of vibrant persons who impact the lives of others just through the force of their personality. Diana Mahabir Wyatt is one of those extremely rare persons. From the time she began her life in the intense, cold, northern Canadian climate of Quebec to her warm, adopted home in Port of Spain, Diana has woven a rich tapestry of images and humanity around her, which has allowed her to stand out for her strong feminist beliefs and an unswerving passion for justice. A passion for justice. Diana Mahabir Wyatt, Independent Senator, 1987-2000. to 2000. Diana Mahabia Wyatt has almost cerulean blue eyes that stare out at the world with quiet assessment but hidden determination. In a room filled with people, she creates conversation without speaking. Such is the command of her persona. However, when she does talk, you listen and you are convinced. As an independent senator serving in the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago over three consecutive terms, 1987 to 1991, 1992 to 1995, 1995 to 2000, Diana Mahabia Wyatt had a lot to say. Her contributions covered more than 100 bills, several motions, and through membership in a number of parliamentary committees. However, it is her intense advocacy of the rights of the child that caused her to resign from the Senate in silent protest over the non-implementation of legislation on children's rights. Diana is definitely not docile about her beliefs. She is the epitome of a steadfast advocate. What I did was when, I, when we were between one, um, one session and another, I, when we were interviewed by the president at the time, I told him no, I didn't want to go back as a senator because um, there were so many bills that were passed that were not implemented, and I realized that if I were going to, if I were going to use my energy uh, to get something done effectively, I couldn't divide it up. I mean, I, I couldn't do the Senate and work and run a family and do community work and help with battered women. I couldn't do it all. And I thought that what I really wanted, the things, some of those things were like the family court, which finally, 20 years later, we've got the Children's Authority Bill, which we're still fighting for. It's been passed, but the allocation for resources, it, it's meaningless unless we have resources allocated to, to deal with children who are at risk. Um, and then there was the children's bill. On the independent bench, His Excellency the President appoints a diverse assembly of people, but all who have expertise in particular areas. I mean, for example, I was there because uh, President Noor Hassan Ali wanted to have a voice about the environment, and that was much of my work. Uh, in the case of Diana, she had, I mean, to, to, to put it in a few words, she was a person of great compassion and a person who had concern for basic rights that we expect in a civilized society. And she was a champion for those who didn't have a voice. You know, many other people, groups, organizations, can shout to get attention. But Diana rarely spoke for those without a voice. 
started, when we were introduced, um, she introduced to the juvenile brand counseling, she started offering little tidbits of training program. And it was free. She used her coalition against domestic violence help and aid. And she was able to start counseling classes. Every program that we developed in the Juvenile Bureau, Diana was there with us. If she didn't participate, she would come and she would offer her expertise. Two programs that stood out for me, for Diana, is that she was able to um, work with the, um, to source um, the um, Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers, two expert female officers, and she brought them here to Trinidad and Tobago and she trained us in interviewing skills, expert interviewing skills for um, sexual abuse children. And we did the anatomically correct dolls. She was able to, um, to work with us to bring those dolls in Trinidad and Tobago. And she trained us together with other um, networking NGOs and FBOs and social workers and, and schools, um, teachers and all of them. She brought all of us together at Cascade for a whole week and Diana together well, with domestic violence, um, coalition against domestic violence, and she trained us. And thereafter, she followed up on every program that we were having. Then she went on again to train divisionally in the police service. Every division, we had components of it right here on the fifth floor. And Diana would come and would train every training in counseling, in domestic violence, in procedure, in practices, in policy. Diana was there for the training and to be the police service. Although she grew up in Quebec, Diana was born in Toronto in 1941. Her mother was a teacher of English literature and her father a surgeon. It was through her father's decision to move his young family to an almost isolated region in Canada that Diana was able to become part of a global community that was heavily populated by refugees from war-torn Europe. Therefore, from an early age, Diana was exposed to people from all over the world and to their vastly different cultures, costumes, languages, religions and ethnic customs, a key experience that prepared her for life in multicultural Trinidad. I can remember a particular incident when I was five because I was at school by then and I had a first grade teacher that I got into an argument with a little boy who sat in front of me whose name was Billy McNeely and she came to try to settle down the argument. I told you Celtic people are difficult. And she said something about, well, boys can do that, but girls can't. And hello, at five, you're gonna tell me that boys could do something that girls can't? And I was so angry with her, and angry with him, and I immediately started arguing that girls could do anything that boys can, and usually we could do it better. And furthermore, I think I could beat up every boy in my class when I was five, so I thought that proved it. At the age of 17, Diana enrolled at McGill University in Montreal, where she met her first husband, a Trinidadian. This man was former government minister, Dr. Winston Jules Mohabir, who would also emerge as a dominant figure on the Trinidad and Tobago landscape. At 19, although she had not completed her degree, Diana accompanied Dr. Mahabir on his return home and soon became a volunteer at the Lady Hochoy Home for the Handicapped. The birth of two children quickly followed before she returned to McGill University with children in tow to complete her degree. Back in Trinidad, Diana first taught at St. Augustine Girls High School and later at the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at the University of the West Indies. During this time, she had two more children and had begun studying for her master's degree. I have known Diana over many years. I mean, casually, I mean, we'd meet. I knew who she was. I, she knew who I was. We spoke with each other. She was at the university while I was there. But then the university, of course, uh, is a diverse place and she would be doing work in one faculty, I would be in another and so on. But I've known her over the years. In fact, I, I, it, I imagine that my first meeting with her 
probably goes back into the 1960s when I had just come back and joined Yui from come back from uh, doing my doctorate in London. So I met her on and off then, and it was only, I mean, we were not strangers when I got to the Senate, uh, but uh, we became very much involved in that particular uh, parliament, that's the fifth parliament. Uh, we became very much involved. It was a very, very active independent bench, and she played an extremely prominent role in it. At age 26, with four children to take care of and a demanding workload, Diana drew on the network support of dedicated housekeepers and learned how many of their colleagues in other households were often exploited and abused. She, on the other hand, was known for treating her housekeepers like family, providing them with training and avenues for improving their education. With this latent desire to get better working conditions for others, particularly women, Diana's feminist beliefs became more public. As a host on an early morning radio magazine program, Diana focused on how international relations, economics and politics affected women's issues. In the 1970s, she took on the monster of domestic violence, attending conferences and workshops on the issue. This led to a more proactive period, with her becoming a founding member of the Shelter for Battered Women and Children in Port of Spain with the advice and encouragement of Radhika Saif, who had previously opened a similar safe house in San Fernando called the Business and Professional Women's Halfway House. Diana is that kind of person who cloaks you. She, she covers you with a cloak. And when Diana has something to do, Diana will do it and she, she will go to every nook and cranny. I first met Diana being in the 90s. Um, at that time, I was working at the Juvenile Bureau and Counseling Services. It's a new section coming out of the 1991, I think Diana was an advocate with the Domestic Violence Act, when the very first act came out. And every, um, the successive commissioner then formed this Juvenile Bureau and Counseling Services for us to deal with the offenses coming out of the act and we were housed in Port of Spain. Now we did some training, but the level of training to, for Diana wasn't sufficient to deal with the kind of, of, of interaction we were having with the general public. And I met Diana, in fact, the first time I met Diana, I went to do a training program in Belmont. The Rape Crisis Society offered a training program in counseling. And I went to the program and Diana, um, sauntered in the class with a very large basket and in that basket she had all her accoutrements and she sat in the class and very unassuming went about her business but my eye was stuck on this basket that Diana had and thereafter anywhere I go after I if I go into a training program I would take a basket with me and put all my accoutrements in it because I find it went with the person and that was the first time I ever actually had I've seen her Diana Mahabaya Wild, but that's the first time I ever had interaction with her. And we stuck on like water and ice. In 1988, both women saw the need for a common forum and began working towards the coalition against domestic violence with other women's groups involved in domestic violence. Over the years, the coalition against domestic violence evolved its own programs, including peace, love, and understanding in schools, Childline, and Stop Elderly Abuse Now. Then Diane Mahabia Wyatt found herself in Parliament, and there was now a publicly accepted platform for her to champion human rights issues. During her 12 plus years in the Senate, the high profile advocate vigorously pursued and supported amendments to legislation on industrial relations, equal opportunities for minorities, the Domestic Violence Act, the Sexual Offenses Act, Children's Legislation, and the Cohabitation Act, among others. In 1995, Mahabia Wyatt created history when she piloted a private bill which was passed in the Senate. The bill called on the Central Statistical Office to keep an official record of unremunerated work done in the country. And what I was just trying to do in that bill was to say to society, should value this work because our values tend to be very monetary 
And if the more money you have, the more people um, grant you status and power. But if you're not getting paid for what you're doing, and you can't get paid for what you're doing, then a value should be put on that work by society so that you get the same sort of status and recognition as you would if it were being valued. And of course, deep down inside, I was also thinking long term that if we could get that into the statistics and get a genuine valuation of unwaged work of both men and women, um, when the national insurance had to kick in, that when people got old and could no longer work after they'd been working for their whole lives, they could get, um, they could get pension in their own right. It did go through and the census now is supposed to reflect it, but in fact they took it down from eight different questions in the census to two or three. It's still something, it's one small step um, towards where we're going to get, but it's not what I hoped it would be. If you go through the record, you will see her the pioneering effort with regarding children, regarding women, regarding homes for the elderly, regarding prisoners and the way we treat them and so on. And she has a distinguished record in this respect. But <laughs> I must emphasize that although that was her main thrust, or you can sense this, she actually made sterling contributions in other areas. In fact, even in, in areas that you would not ex necessarily expect everyone in the independent bench to be able to express a firm, uh, clear uh, views. Parliament is important to me because it is one of the institutions, one of the institutions that is established in order to give structure to, to society. And without that structure, we would have chaos. And because of that, I don't think that Parliament is the, the most perfect system. It's not an ideal system, but it's the best we've got. But departing the Senate did not mean that Diana Mahabia Wyatt had lost a public forum for her passionate views. Instead, she grew more focused. She joined the Trinidad and Tobago Coalition on the Rights of the Child and remains an executive member of that organization as well as the Caribbean and Latin American Rights of the Child Association. It is via this organization that she received a five-week fellowship in Sweden to study the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child courtesy of the Swedish government and Rada Banen. The thing is that the Senate passes bill after bill into act after act and doesn't implement it. And, and there are far too many non-implemented acts that are just sitting there waiting for action. Um, words do matter, yes, but there is a limitation to what words can do. After words have been spoken, then somebody has to get up and do something. And that was really um, it was it was when somebody said to me behind the speaker's chair when I said thank you so much for your help in getting this particular bill through and his response was well yeah we got the bill through but now somebody's got to go and put it into effect so you know isn't that what you where you should be putting your energies and I thought the man's right mm. Today, after more than 35 years of campaigning against domestic violence, Diana has an enormous regard for women and their ability to survive atrocities. She is likewise concerned about the elderly who often receive substandard treatment in institutions and correspondingly applauds the parenting courses run by Serval, wishing they had been available to her when she was a young mother. She also was able to, to work with um, um, Mrs. Dinoon, one of our retired senior superintendents. She retired as an acting assistant commissioner. And they were able to develop a program where they included persons from the Caribbean in, in um, training domestic violence um, teachers. So you had the train the trainer program. It came out of the University of the West Indies. Diana was there again, head to head with us working with us and we were able to have these trained trainers both in Trinidad and Tobago and in the Caribbean 
They were trained at the University of the West Indies. So these persons now went back to the, the various Caribbean countries and in Trinidad and Tobago, and we were able now to go to the various divisions and train and retrain people in domestic violence. So I would say Diana Mojave has been a commissioner of police <laughs> for quite a long time. In 2006, the energetic advocate became the executive director of the Caribbean Center for Human Rights, an organization which includes a victim support program that visits and supports the families of homicide victims in Trinidad and Tobago. The CCHR also is identified by its human rights education program, which has published books and pamphlets on human rights, encourages a junior CCHR program in secondary schools, and does presentations in schools on the subject. There is also an internship program that introduces graduating law students from universities in TNT, the UK and the USA to human rights cases here as they are exposed through the law courts. Remarried in 1982 to Noel Wyatt, Diana is currently Managing Director of Personnel Management Services Caribbean Limited, a management consultancy firm she has with her husband whose core business is human resource management development. But her passion is never daunted. She remains actively involved with the Shelter for Battered and Abused Women and Children, which serves as a counseling resource center for those in abusive situations. As she grows older, Diana has turned to meditation and nature for balance in her life and is catching up on quality time with her four children, three foster children, three stepchildren, and all of her grandchildren, of which there are many. I am very strongly in favor of alternative dispute resolution, particularly when it comes to the petty civil matters and criminal matter dealing with young offenders. Diana Mahabia Wyatt, Community Mediation Bill, July 7, 1998. In 1990, several of Diana's poems were published in The Washerwoman, the first anthology of poems by women of Trinidad and Tobago. Her advice to women is to focus on education as well as develop their emotional and spiritual intelligence so that they can become more attuned to others and enable themselves to lead lives that are meaningful on an integrated level. She is really, she's really someone that I, I cherish as a friend. I cherish, I don't even think I have told her that. You know, I, I need to tell her that I cherish as a friend. Because you know something, when you walk along the definition of friendship, there are a lot of things you need to throw away. You know, I walk along the, the path that I have had with Diana, and there's nothing I want to throw away. I want to preserve every moment that we had together, because she's really, she worked, and why I, I love her that much is that Diana selflessly gave to this police service we never paid Diana for no project that she assists us with. She never asked for, 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 for funding, nothing. Diana just came in, domestic violence, child abuse, child sexual abuse, training, she just keep coming, coming, offering, offering, offering all the time. Yeah. Speaking in the Senate, uh, is somewhat different from speaking in the House of Representatives where there's the adversarial atmosphere. And um, uh, Diana was a, was a very, very brilliant speaker, absolutely precise in the use of her words. Uh, she had her own unique way of expressing that passion <laughs> that I spoke about. You could tell she never read anything out she had notes in front of us, like all of us. You know? But when she spoke, if you saw her put down her papers, you knew that something was coming from the heart. When Diana Mahabia emerged on the local scene, it was as the stunningly attractive wife of a prominent senior government minister. Her trademark, headbands, and a style and look similar to Jackie Kennedy, wife of the former US President John Kennedy, brought her instant attention. 
Then the real Diana began to be heard in the boardrooms of community centers, from homes for abused women and children to the floors of the Parliament Chamber. She stomped all over Trinidad and Tobago, into the Caribbean and internationally as she impacted change for human rights causes. I, I put everything I have done in one context. It's all human rights. Industrial relations to me is a human rights issue and I have been involved in industrial relations for um, 40 years and to me how you treat people at work is, is a measure of human rights, it's a measure of, of spiritual involvement in life. I just can't stand to see injustice done. I, I just feel I get angry, I get impatient, I get difficult. It's the old Celtic thing again, you know, I just uh, have to do something about it. Her, her contribution is like, today I heard um, the wife of, of General Colin Powell um, speak about, she, she came to do the, the mentoring program, to launch the Ministry of National Security mentoring program today at Napa. And she was one of the, the, the keynote speakers there. And she spoke about mentoring and volunteerism. And she said, picture the Mississippi River flowing through the many countries and the very tributaries that feed into that river. And she says, when that river empties out into the sea, she said it goes out for 200 feet. First, the, the power of that river goes out there. Diana is that river. She's that river which flows along and she, does, she doesn't let people feed into her. She feeds into people. She feeds into people. She like the river of life. In 2011, Diana Mahabia Wyatt was among the first recipients of a new national award title, the Medal for the Development of Women. She received a gold medal. Born a feminist with a passion for justice, Diana soldiers on. Well, are you ready for a brand new discovery? Calypso, Calypso. A passion for justice, Diana Mahabir Wyatt, independent senator, 1987 to 2000.